Welcome, and thank you for attending today's Healthcare IT News and HIMSS Industry Solutions webinar, St. Charles Medical Group's Optimization for Outcomes-Based Improvement, sponsored by Galen Healthcare Solutions. During this webinar, you'll learn actionable improvement methods for clinical systems utilization, strategies to increase operational efficiency through data-driven analysis, and methodology to address quality gain system utilization. Our speakers for today's event are John Weinsheim, Chief Executive Officer of the St. Charles Medical Group, Rob Ross, Medical Director of Community Health Strategy for the St. Charles Medical Group, and John Buckley, Lead Consultant for Galen Healthcare. With that, I'd like to hand it over to John Buckley to begin our presentation. Thank you. So I'd just like to have the three of us introduce ourselves, um, give us a little bit of background. Okay. Um, uh, this is John Weinsheim. I am the Chief Executive Officer for St. Charles Medical Group. Um, I've been here with the medical group for the past five years. Um, uh, I'll spend a few minutes after introductions telling you a little bit more about um, our journey and, uh, and the medical group itself. I'm Dr. Rob Roth. I'm a family physician by trade, but my job here at the medical group, and I've been here for three and a half years, is um, essentially opening and operating the medical homes, doing uh, population-based health care, and also in this capacity, I chair the provider IT committee for the medical group. Great. Thank you both. Um, this is John Buckley. I am a lead consultant with Galen Healthcare. I've worked with Galen for eight years in various capacities, including, um, you know, technical, um, you know, more application support, and uh, most recently, um, mostly project management. Um, and I've been working with uh, St. Charles Medical Group for going on about 18 months now um, during this project. So um, we'll move forward with the, with the presentation. Um, just a high-level um, agenda for, for the presentation. Um, we're going to we collected some data during the registration process that we'll quickly go through um, that I think will set a good foundation for the overall presentation. And then I'll hand it over to John um, Weinsheim to go through the, the background on the medical group, where they were um, leading into the, the um, leading into knowing that they needed to do an optimization project um, and then sort of defining what those goals for that project were. And then we'll get into sort of the meat of the presentation of what we accomplished during the, the past 18 months that we've been here. So I will turn. So the, the questions that were asked at the beginning of the um, registration process, are you considering EHR changes um, and have you run an optimization? So basically, you know, 79% of all the polled registrations said that they were sticking with their existing system, 50% of which have optimized. And of those um, remaining 50% um, considering a change have not optimized. So there's sort of a, you know, it sort of speaks to the need for optimization relative to the overall set success of um, an EHR implementation. Um, so I will move forward. The, the next set of questions um, sort of pulled the registration um, folks to what vendor that they were using to try to sort of categorize um, the optimization versus change question. 21% um, 20, um, said that they were considering change. That meant 79% again were not. And as you can see, um, the, the most interesting thing is that of the major platforms that which we sort of identified as Allscript, Cerner, Epic, and Meditech, 38% were sort of, you know, satisfied with their non major EHR platform. So 
So that being said, I'd like to turn things over to John um, to sort of go through the background of the medical group. Perfect. Thanks, John. So I'm going to spend the next couple minutes uh, just providing some background around our journey, who we are, um, you know, um, how we got, as John said, to making a determination that we <laughs> that we needed an optimization, uh, and sort of that pathway as well. Um, as you can see on the slide, and I'll talk a little bit more about it here, St. Charles Medical Group uh, is currently a group of about 225 employed providers. Um, we cover 21 different specialties um, and uh, an area that uh, geographically is throughout central Oregon, uh, three different counties, um, four different hospital areas and clinics, and probably 13 different locations. Um, we have about half of those providers uh, are working in the ambulatory space or on our ambulatory EHR product. Uh, we have a fairly large cohort of providers um, who are on the hospital side as well. And um, for St. Charles, that is a different platform um, than, than all scripts. Um, we uh, have come from a place where we really started this group uh, in earnest in, in uh, 2011. So um, our journey started um, with a cohort of 16 providers um, that quickly grew um, from, as you can imagine, that period of time uh, to 225. Um, when we first started St. Charles Medical Group, we uh, had uh, made a determination about the ambulatory EMR product really before we had a group here um, of any scale, um, which uh, has, as you can imagine, uh, its challenges in having participation on the part of the providers who weren't here uh, to engage in the uh, initial implementation of all scripts. Um, and so uh, we did, I think, the best we could do uh, in the absence of having a lot of uh, good um, uh, clinical insight from practicing providers to put a package in place that was sort of out of the box uh, with all scripts. Um, and uh, what we recognized over time was that that out of the box implementation um, was not situated for success as we grew across different specialties. Um, um, so uh, as we rolled through the development of some of these um, uh, some, some of these specialties, um, uh, uh, we started to understand where some of those deficits were um, specifically. And in, again, uh, we kind of grew up together um, with St. Charles Health System. Uh, we had have an ambulatory um, uh, IT team here that um, you know uh, str struggled to grow with us in, in some regards, uh, and uh, you know there, we, we run many applications outside of all scripts, uh, and uh, so having that team uh, you know to provide the optimization level support that we needed was confounded a little bit by by simply growing uh, early and often, uh, so we added. Uh, new provider groups, new practices, new PMs, uh, and uh, did not have as much time, I think, as uh, as some would ex would like to have in terms of um, catching our breath uh, as we grew. Um, so fast, sort of fast forward to a place where uh, the our group, and again, Dr. Ross mentioned earlier, he heads our IT steering committee here, uh, uh, where we reached a, a point that um, our group got together and, and uh, we, instead of doing incremental uh, changes and fixes here, uh, we reset our just conversation about what were we trying to achieve uh, in terms of the overall strategy for our EMR um, and really uh, identified four areas that we uh, were fo hoping to focus on. Um, one of them was was the fairly fundamental and probably not part of the optimization, and that was just ensuring a, a stable computing environment, um, which we had struggled with um, in some regards, which, you know, it's not uncommon, I think, for lots of different health systems. Um, but the but the primary one, and this is where it's sort of important, I think, uh, to have a focus on a broad uh, uh, vision for what you're looking to do. Wasn't we needed to fix a note or fix you know a particular workflow? Uh, it was really much broader than that, and that was ensuring ease of documentation and cre creating usable data. Um, and so we sort of used these lenses as our frame for how we were going to or where, where we needed to go. Um, um, you know, uh, and again, none of these are sort of earth shattering. We focused on efficient, accurate, and complete order processing, for example, uh, as a very fairly broad category. Um, and so, having understood some of the the, um, uh, the real areas of focus, 
uh, we, we set about, about to set some priorities within that area and came up with a, first a, a top 20 uh, list and then narrowed it down to sort of a top 10 list of things we wanted to focus on and, um, and initially uh, went to the vendor um, to you know, participate with us in uh, some optimization work to get us from here to there. And um, that did not work out as we had hoped. Um, and so, again, this is really more about what Galen uh, did to, to assist us and not what our vendor didn't do. But um, it, it, from just a bit of history, um, we were not able to garner the kind of support that we needed uh, from our vendor at the time. Uh, to get us to the place where uh, we really needed to get uh, to to um, uh, to ensure an environment that our providers could work in, um, we had had some experience working with Galen on other projects, um, and uh, uh, you know came to them with a request uh, to consider uh, an optimization pathway. What would that look like? Um, do you understand what we're talking about at this high level of you know making a usable EHR and uh, you know not Again, not focused on specific details, but can you um, understand our vision? Um, I think we had a, a we had a uh, uh, an excellent meeting of minds about what that meant uh, and what was what, what intrigued us most um, and gave us the greatest amount of comfort was that the team from Galen uh, could very much speak in a way that that connected both with the, our uh, leadership group, but also with the uh, providers and the practices. Um, and so that's how we sort of uh, uh, started our journey. Um, and, and they understood that really the key around the success of this project was, again, not was necessarily whether that order processed in, you know, uh, in five steps or seven. It's whether our, uh, our providers were satisfied with using the product, in, uh, you know, at all, whether it was getting the outcomes we needed um, and you know, getting them home earlier uh, as sort of you know core measures of uh, of success uh, with the EHR. Um, uh, so that's some background about sort of how we got into the discussion with uh, with John and his team. Um, again, we had some su some success with them in the past, which was very helpful to uh, I think both to both parties um, to get get to a place. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that optimization. Uh, was now in a little greater detail with John and Dr. Ross, but um, that's some background on on sort of uh, you know, sort of how we got to, to the place we were, um, as John says, about now almost about 18 months ago. So, well, thanks, John. Um, before we dive too far into you know the overall project, I just wanted to give some background. If, if folks on the line have not heard of Galen before. Uh, we were recently named best in class um, under technical services. Um, we focus primarily on, you know, clinical platforms um, uh, with a with a um, specialty in sort of um, all scripts, Epic, Meditech, um, and uh, Orion, um, Inner Systems, and Merck, just to name a few. Um, are one of the other services that we really have come a long way with and are sort of really refining and I think um, played a part in the, in the number one class rank was our conversion team, which um, was another part of the project that, that we did do with St. Charles. Um, it's not going to be part of this um, particular presentation. Um, and overall, you know, like I think I said, I've been here for eight years and working with clients, um, usually on long-term projects. And one of the, the core, or two of the core values um, that Galen sort of brings to the table is um, perpetually learning and sharing, which I hope um, is, you know, what we're doing here, as well as, you know, this this industry can be really tough, you know, for everyone. So we really try to have a fun time. And I think that, you know, this group in particular has, you know, worked hard and had fun doing it. Um, so um, that being said, we'll move forward. Um, I think that one of the things that John had mentioned really on, um, you know, sort of setting the stage for the presentation is this out-of-the-box EHR um, that I think you guys purchased from Allscripts. And this is not an uncommon, um, you know, theme, I guess. Um, I think the, the, there was some artificial demand created by uh, the Meaningful Use Incentive Programs. And that caught probably a lot of vendors off, you know, off their A game. 
and you know organizations were you know sort of scrambling to figure out how to implement an EHR to capture those uh, incentives early on in the process, right? Um, and what you guys did was not uncommon. You you purchased uh, an EHR solution, and I'm not talking about like the ones you go and pick up at Costco. I'm talking about a major um, a major brand that you know you had some you know that had a reputation at the time of being uh, I don't know if they were best in class or you know they were up there in, in class rating at the time yeah, so that's right. um, and I think that part of that promise is you know minimal operational workflows minimal IT support relative to the overall implementation strategy and what I'll say is that in my experience doing this you guys did a pretty good job up front most um, groups that had you know bought into this methodology um, usually get to within one or two practices before they realize hey this isn't really working um, previous engagements I had been pulled in usually around the third specialty and that's where they realized that there needed to be a, you know sort of a, a reset process and you guys had managed to roll it out um, you know with marginal success to you know your entire ambulatory practice um, but the, the thing of it was is that it was a constant struggle from a workflow perspective. Can, can I jump in here? Yeah, just for, because my first experience of the St. Charles Medical Group, we had actually implemented uh, electronic medical record in my previous practice of about 40, 35 providers, but we had spent so much time on configuration and implementation and it was uh, distressing to me because within the first three months of being here, I recognized that there was a lot of provider dissatisfaction with the installation, implementation, and training, and not just with the providers, but with the IT department. And I think, to John's point, uh, it's so important to invest up front in implementation and training. I think no matter what EMR you're using, if you don't invest enough at the beginning and, and do a really good job, uh, it will come to naught. So I just wanted to put that in there. And that was the genesis of our IT provider steering committee because of the dissatisfaction and the difficulty in entering data and workflows. Yeah, and, and I'll jump in again. This is John Weinstein. So, but, but in, in knowing that, post implementation of a product um, so w there were two pathways that an organization like ours could have chosen one of them was to start over um, and I think you'll see you see that in sort of John's original question to the group about what folks are considering doing um, and we chose not to we chose to attempt to optimize a product that we felt had the capacity to do the job we just had not done as good a job to implement it in the first place and so I think as we go through, um, you know, the, the the balance of this discussion today, that that was an important pivot point for us. And again, uh, having an expectation and a comfort level that the team that that Galen brought to the table um, could do that was it was a fairly important decision for us. Um, uh, you know, versus have, putting that effort and and expense into uh, into implementing a different solution. So or trying to restart again, all, you know, from scratch with, with all scripts. So, um, and, and uh, you know, not to jump ahead to the end of the conversation, but, uh, you, you know, our, our uh, outcomes through that process, I think, I think uh, validated the um, decision to move forward with an optimization instead of attempting to move to another product, so. Um, great. Um, I just wanted to also ask, uh, John, you sort of mentioned this when you were, were going through where you were. But one of the first things that I heard when when I first came on board was, you know, how do we measure provider satisfaction and and do it in sort of an objective way? And I think that um, you know between conversations between Dr. Ross and um, Todd Fernald and the previous program director Kevin, um, you know, we sort of tried coming up with a strategy that sort of measured provider success relative to not taking their work home. Is, is that a fairly reasonable, I mean, do you want to speak yeah. to that? Yeah, so uh, we did a pre-optimization survey that 
really ask people how successful they were at completing their charts and getting their tasks done on time so they weren't sticking around at night until 10 and 11 o'clock and ask general satisfaction questions about the EHR. And it was pretty clear from those and from the comments that we needed to spend some considerable effort on, on in, ensuring that the workflows were really good and, and trying to streamline the processing of patient data entry and information and, and charting. For sure. Okay, great. So what I wanted to take a minute to talk about is just our optimization sort of methodology, what, what we look to do when we're, you know, first brought onto these projects. It's uh, one of the things that I learned really early on is that no optimization project is sort of the same. It really depends on where the starting point is. The, uh, the, the end goal is sort of always the same, but, you know, just knowing where, where to start sort of facilitates how we're going to get there. Um, and one thing that I really want to point out that, you know, was, was sort of set up in advance of us getting here was uh, a, a good change management um, strategy. Um, you guys definitely deployed a, a three-legged um, stool approach. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then um, one of the other things that we sort of looked for really on is how well did the organization communicate within um, and to direct towards the end user? So that's something that is is always on my mind when we're doing an optimization project like this. And it, it's really communication is one of the most difficult things that I've seen in uh, in my experience. Um, the other thing is provider engagement. You know how I've been work, working with your providers directly. I think that a lot of um, uh, providers get felt neglected with that fast track implementation and the, having them become stakeholders and invested is sort of one of the keys that I look for. Um, and then the other, the other part that we can talk about a little bit more is the office workflows and leveraging, you know, taking things off of the provider's plates where, where appropriate onto medical assistance and taking things that are appropriate to take off the medical assistance um, plates and put them onto ancillary staff. So it's, you know, what you're really trying to do is facilitate, you know, a model that, you know, where everyone can be comfortable within their certain scope and uh, performing at a, at a, you know, within a high performance environment. Uh, the last two things um, we'll talk about one of the, 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 the need for leadership, I, I applaud both of you. We'll talk more about this. You kind of stuck your neck out there a couple times for us, but it was necessary. Um, so we'll talk about the need for that. Um, and then finally, the fact that being on an electronic health record means that there's a whole lot of data that, that's left to explore out there. And, you know, we're not talking about meaningful use. We're talking about actual productivity analysis. And sometimes those can, um, you know, reflect, build considerations that, you know, will overall, you know, impact the organization. So we'll uh, take a deep dive into those in just a minute. And I'll say something, Galen, the comments about your team being engaged with providers, that was a huge win for us because you were out in the clinics and doing this one-on-one -on -one with the providers and the comments were always incredibly positive about the engagement and what, what you could get done day to day. So that was very helpful to us in an environment where the, you know, there was a fair degree of provider dissatisfaction with the EMR. Right. Um, so what I have, uh, what I'm presenting right now is um, uh, a hierarchy relative to change management relative to, um, you know, the, the way that you can usually customize an EHR. And for folks on the phone, you might see, um, you know, a bullet point that wouldn't be normal. Um, you might see practice as something that you would normally want to combine with specialty. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, basically, the idea is that specialty and practice would be sort of uniform across all groups. Um, but in an optimization strategy, especially after, you know, 
the discovery phase of optimization, it was very clear that there was a high level of variance between um, the various practices, and it was probably, you know, it's it's not typical to to assume that like groups are going to operate their own way on a paper world. Now you've created a, a an EHR environment that you know you need to apply standards to, and it's not just workflow standards but documentation standards. So because of that variance, and I've seen this a number of times, we've sort of inserted that extra layer. Um, and so this is just a, you know, a, a brief diagram that sort of takes our approach into consideration. It, it kind of goes top to bottom and then bottom to top. And by that, I mean you always want to focus making enterprise changes because of the fact that it hits so many of the end users in hopefully positive ways. Um, the problem that we find in these optimization projects is because of the you know workflow variance, it's really hard to predict what your what the outcome is going to be. So as we you know move through the optimization project, what we were trying to do is create you know various iterative 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 waves of um, you know, enterprise changes while we're gathering feedback at both the specialty and practice level. So, you know, as we were, were proceeding with the optimization plan, we'd gather feedback from those lower levels, bring them back up, what made sense for the other groups, and deploy those changes as we as we needed to. And the end goal would be something um, similar to this, where you know, eventually you would see practice and specialty kind of grouped together in that hierarchy. And the one the one other minor thing that I would sort of call out is with the um, patient care teams um, sort of being utilized, you know, you might see a little bit of variance um, from practice to practice because you're talking about introducing a multi-specialty environment. Um, but, you know, most most vendors um, even really try to shoot for this, this desired state. Do you guys have any? Questions about that? No, no. So, um, just coming back to change management for a second. As I said, um, St. Charles had a, a change advisory board or change management board in place. They met weekly from an operational perspective. Uh, we had physician representation by Dr. Ross as well as another specialty provider. Um, um, also nominated physician champion. And my overall observation in the past 18 months is that process has really matured. Um, I think that, you know, when we started this process, we were really working in the weeds because of the fact that there are so many problems in the weeds that need to be solved. And as we sort of progressed and used this approach, um, things have matured, and there have been a number of instances, even in the past couple of weeks, where, you know, last year at this time, or maybe a year and a half ago at this time, we would be talking about some of these things for 20 minutes, and, you know, with the maturity and the confidence that, you know, the, the team has developed, it sort of got to a point where we didn't have to have those 20-minute conversations anymore. You know, I, I think there was an example about financial authorization on on specific orders, you know, let's just solve that problem by reaching out to uh, financial authorization folks. It's no need to discuss. Um, so we're pulling those types of questions out and then talking about DOR checking, uh, which is always a, a fun topic. Um, uh, so one other thing that I really try to recommend when we have these types of meetings is come to the table with not just a proposal, but make, make it more of a proposal in the sense that it's a yes or no question. I, I really hate the open-ended, what do you think about this, because it leads to those 20-minute conversations, and usually you don't leave with the result that you're hoping for. So that's really something that I tried with my team to try to, to, to bring to the table. I don't know. Sometimes it didn't work out the way that I wanted. but. Um, <laughs> Um, and the other thing is that oh, one of the bullet points I have here is realize things might get worse 
than before they get better. And one of the, one of the real keys there was, you know, in the HIM process, we realized that because of the huge gap in workflows, we had to take a, a temporary workaround and apply it to the groups as we optimized it, which result in, you know, common complaints like, okay, this isn't an optimal situation, but the intention was is that once we got to a critical path, we could undo that work with the intention that we've just made it better for everyone. Um, does that make sense? Yes, and, and I think the group appreciated having a yes, no, answers to a lot of things. I certainly did because I like to make decisions, you know that. So that so that if you come to the group and uh, with a specific question that can be answered definitively, that worked much better than than just talking about it for sure. Right. So I will We talked a little bit about this before, and the, the composition of that you know enterprise group was consisted of um, doctors, providers, um, operational directors, managers, and IT. And that sort of represents the three-legged stool. I don't know if you guys have heard of that before. I've heard of it a number of times. And really, you know, IT represents system stability. Um, the provider insight, you know, is hoping for you know. The, the best possible patient outcomes where operations has to maintain workload across the, the clinical and ancillary staff. So um, this isn't anything that, you know, this is what I've seen at many other groups. The only other thing that I will say that I really liked about working with you guys was the fact that, you know, in comparison to other groups, you know, we kept the, the group concise enough where, you know, we could still make decisions but you know, we, we also had a collected group of managers that had investment into the process. And in comparison to other groups that I've worked with, you know, some of those change management meetings can be 100 people. And trying to get a decision with 100 people can be next to impossible. Yeah, that's an important point there, too. This is John Weinsham again um, to point out. And I think that um, we, as part of the overall process for optimization and then improvement, um, we really invested in, in, in allowing the folks that do the work to be engaged in the improvements. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I uh, as the CEO of the medical group, are probably the least uh, facile at navigating the EHR. Um, so having me on the committee uh, to you know, rec make recommendations or make decisions around changes was not that helpful to the team. Um, but allowing and freeing up the time um, and making the investment that folks, uh, you know, whether it's our managers or our, our, our MAs, and certainly the physicians um, who, who see those workflows uh, are, are engaged and, and participating both with the optimization work that's happening in the clinics, but also in the change management, um, you know, uh, I think has led to the, at least whatever level of success we have at this point. So, mm -hmm. um, Great. So one of the other things that I mentioned before relative to communication strategy, um, at a previous engagement I, I worked with, they did a study within, and it was a very large organization in the Midwest where um, they polled um, physicians and um, over 60% of them had not ever logged into their organization's email accounts. So that just immediately throws a red flag for me. Um, especially when communication is so, you know, pivotal and success of these things. You're going to be doing integrate, you know, iterative change, so you have to be able to let the, the end users know. Um, and then, you know, a lot of groups do adopt the, the, the super user, and I'm all for super users, but generally speaking, they're busy sort of helping facilitate running their own practice and then throwing, um, you know, incremental changes made it really difficult for them to keep up. So I think that what we were trying to accomplish was, you know, a, a plan that was sort of consistent and, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, regular. Um, um, so the one thing that I really appreciate with, um, you know, with your ops team has been that, that weekly huddle that goes out every Friday. We 
sort of determine that changes will be made on a Tuesday. So if, if there's, there's a couple of days to sort of get the communication, digest what that means, and plan accordingly when, when, when changes were going to be made. Do um, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think the, the two-way communication was really quite excellent because we actually had a very strong engagement team that went out to the individual practices and specialty, and then we would get feedback through that group when you were engaged uh, with the individual provider groups and uh, had some information at our change management committee, and usually were fairly well informed, made a decision, had, a, had an implementation date in the EMR that was the same every week, and communicated it exactly three days before and outlined very specifically in that usual, usually one or two pages of the weekly huddle, the most important things, and let people read that and choose whether or not they would read the less important things. But I think that it took a little while to get that <clears throat> that communication strategy uh, going, but once we did, it seemed to work very well, actually. Great. So one other thing that, whether you guys realized this when I was doing it or not, I, I will confess um, one of the things that I do really on in the, in the process of optimization is I test the, the communication strategy. So shortly after um, the first upgrade that we assisted with, we had uh, we brought a very large cardiology group on where we specifically designed workflow changes that we knew were part of the, the end goal. Um, and one of those was directing um, electronic prescription requests coming in via SureScripts to the nursing pool versus directly to the provider. The intention was to, especially in the primary care realm, to take that off of the, the primary care physician's plate where it warranted you know, a medical assistance role to be able to, to fulfill those, those tasks um, and take that, that workload off of the, um, the provider's plate. And I, and I can speak to, you know, John, you probably got, I don't know how many emails when that change first went down um, where, where it really was taken aback. I mean, one of the providers, um, said it was a great idea, but I just didn't know that it was happening. So um, again, it was sort of just a test to, okay, what can we expect for future changes at this level that makes sense, but you know, we just didn't have a proper communication channel in place. And um, you know, we learned that sort of the hard way. Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, we'll, we'll always hear, um, from our docs <laughs> when we've done something incorrectly. So uh, we have that to look, you know, look back on. Um, so this next slide is really talking about provider engagement. This is one of the most important pieces that anyone doing an optimization will, will have to learn and have to sort of use to your advantage. Um, it's a lot to ask providers to, to be taken out of practice, so normally you can expect to do things first thing in the morning or late at night, but the key is to identify at least three physicians um, or, or providers um, that have an investment or in, uh, an investment into the, the success of the project. And the reason why we ask for three is, you know, I've come from an environment that sort of focuses on one, you have a physician lead, and they make all the decisions. You sort of um, deploy the changes in some sort of big go live, and nobody else agrees to that to those changes that were made. So, in the primary care realm, we we met weekly for about ten weeks with at least it was about six providers, yeah. and we wouldn't make changes without at least three providers present. Um, the goal was to create um, sort of an accountability factor and, you know, an invested stakeholder. We want people to be investing in their own success and, you know, not, not, not shortcutting the system using a physician champion where you're 
you're going to overinvest in one particular person's opinion on things. Um, the other the other part of that too is just you know at another group that I work with, it's it's managing the other providers you know in an elected environment where you know someone knows that we're here to help and here to change and you know help facilitating the other providers to sort of embrace that change and say hey it might not be perfect but you know these people are here to help and let's let's work with them versus you know sort of rejecting um, the overall after did you have it no and I think it was it was incredibly important in the primary care sphere we have five clinics and we had folks that were representatives from every clinic on the original provider group. Um, one of the other things coming back to the, the SureScripts um, implementation is that we really try to focus our efforts on maintaining high performance workflows. So one of the part of the groups that sort of rejected those first changes were the groups that, you know, weren't seeing the, the level of volume of patients. So, you know, with the, the medication refill requests, those particular providers, you know, had the time to be doing that and it was such a shock to them to, to not, you know, to, to delegate that work on the MAs that they resisted and I can speak for myself, I lost sleep over that where um, where the, the high performing providers understood and realized, okay, this is a good thing. This is, means that I'll only see the things that I really need to see versus, you know, having to see everything. In the primary care realm, we were talking about hundreds of medication refills every day potentially. So um, I felt like just, you know, accounting for those those workflows in advance and while they weren't well received in some capacities, it created the environment for a high performance system. Well, I think one of the other keys was linking the uh, the medication refills, the standards that were that were presented to the group, uh, so that the MAs could take over that function were linked to the uh, EMR as well, and we got better traction because as the standards were rolled out, within a few weeks we started transferring the ability to renew very, very a succinct number of medications, the very common medications to, to folks below the provider level. And they, I think they saw the benefit of that um, not taking up so much time in their tasking. You know. Yeah, and I don't want to belabor that point, but but I think one that is one of the things that we really recognize um, as a as a as a fundamental element of the success of this uh, is that we had a written standard. Um, and like I think other medical groups or organizations, you have you're likely to have a set of written standards for certain things. Um, there we accelerated that process, recognizing that. Um, in order to be truly successful with this, we really had to have everyone see that standard in, on paper um, uh, and, and share it with them prior to e executing on the change to the workflow. Um, I think that was that has continued to be a key success for us. Right, continual refinement of those standards, and right. that actually speaks well to the next slide because one of the things that you know we sort of saw when we first got here is providers had to sign off on all of the medical assistance, non-medication orders, and immunization. So it was just a, um, a nightmare from the provider's perspective to see some hundreds of tasks, um, you know, signing off on a medical assistance uh, administration of a flu vaccine. So, um, you know, those are the things that we looked at in those standards and, you know, those role-based um, definitions, as I called it up here. Yeah. Um, so hopefully alleviating that stress from the providers, um, you know, sort of ancillary tasking. Um, and you know. one, key, one key to doing, doing that successfully was there was a lot of uh, linkage between the standards committee. Many of the same people sat on that as 
sat on the uh, the committee that was doing the change management. So there was a very strong link between the standards and the implementation of EMR changes. Right. So what I wanted to just talk about and, and really praise you guys for is the fact that you know at some point you realized or believed in what we were doing and kind of stuck your own necks out um, as it related to the work that we were doing. We we were getting pushed back like, you know, we don't need optimization and we don't want to change our ways per se. And, you know, at, at one point or another, Dr. Ross, you took the initiative to say, you know, communicating to those providers saying, you need to trust us, you need to trust these guys, they know what they're doing and, you know, listen and sort of participate in the process. Yeah. In fact, I, I don't know if we have this as part of the presentation, John, but one of the one of the uh, actions that we take now when we do so, – so we went through a serial optimi optimization. Um, and again, I don't know if we'll have enough time to deep dive on all of that today, but uh, from, from one practice to the next practice, and we kicked off each one of those with a fairly strong message uh, from Dr. Ross and from me about uh, about how important it was to be participating in this and that we were doing it um, and that this wasn't a debate at this point about whether we were or weren't going to be moving forward with an uh, optimization. And that came, I think, with the support of the, of the uh, provider, uh, you know, IT committee and the user group as well. But um, it, it turned out, um, we I don't know that we expected it would have as much impact as it did but it had a fairly substantial impact. And so our, our trainers in particular, <laughs> um, and the folks who were in the trenches working with the clinics, uh, 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 relied on us to ensure that we had that communication. And we had we defined a very specific package that we sent out um, you know, certain days in advance as we rolled up to this. I think that was uh, mm -hmm. a really important and effective dimension of, uh, of, of getting everybody on board when we were ready to pull the trigger on a change. So. Right. And, and I'll also speak to, you know, the training and the other, you know, folks a part of the team here, you know, IT analysts and, and the HIM staff. I think that overall everyone has sort of evolved their process. I, I would say that it's far more proactive than it's ever been. Um, you know, HIM assisted us when, you know, certain groups we're documenting in a different fashion and creating the standard across the board that no document, you know, like a PHQ-9 needs to be documented the same place everywhere regardless of who's doing it because, you know, we can't have, on a shared medical record, you can't have data sort of, or clinical data existing in multiple places in the patient's chart. So um, I, I really applaud the, the effort with the team um, as, the, as the maturity has sort of gotten uh, come about. Um, the, you know, leading into this slide, you know, I, I was a software developer for eight years prior to joining Galen and doing this type of work. So I had sort of this advantage um, where I had direct insight into, you know, the database um, and can pull out data as necessary. And one of the first things that I did was, from a productivity perspective, I started pulling out those tasking and message, um, you know, productivity reports. The intention was really to identify points of failure, but what sort of happened was, at one point or another, I think Todd Fernald um, and the former program director said, what are your goals for this optimization? And it came back to, or, you know, Dr. Ross saying, we don't want to see the providers taking their work home. Well, how do we measure that? And what we had come up with is a series of reports relative to note signatures. We also developed reports about tasking and productivity, whether it be how quickly are the providers able to verify their results and how quickly are um, the medical assistants or whomever is, you know, communicating those results to patients relative to, you know, quality uh, initiatives. So those reports sort of represent objective data and, um, you know, it, it sort of came around that while um, some of the surveys that were conducted showed, you know, marginal improvement, the data itself suggested a far greater um, improvement. 
And the other part of this isn't just measuring improvement, it's sort of measuring what initiatives should be in place. Like the other day we were talking about DUR checking and you get the subjective feedback from providers um, often where they see hundreds of these alerts a day and they're irrelevant and while we haven't made a decision on that, what we've actually found by looking at the data is really it's on average about five a day. So, you know, that subjective feedback is, you know, sort of isolated with real data. Um, so that is sort of integral to this optimization project. And I know we're running out of time, so we'll keep moving forward. Um, I'm going to just skip this. Um, I did want to come back around to um, sort of the lessons learned. Uh, generally speaking, I think that St. Charles had the most difficult, it probably still has the most difficult time uh, managing primary care. As, as primary care sort of evolved and they're sort of the center point to uh, patient-centered uh, patient medical home, they're the quarterback for all patient care, um, it, it's a hard job and it's often not financially lucrative either for a lot of providers. So you're, you're putting a lot on these, these providers' plates and, um, you know, they have a lot of work to do, really. So one of the lessons learned that I think, you know, Dr. Ross and I were talking about just before this, um, uh, this presentation was what happens if we had focused on some of the peripheral specialties before hitting primary care? Would they have been... Um, would we have offered them more um, and had a more mature process going into it with, with that group and more buy-in from the rest of the organization? So, and I think that one of the things that sort of led us to that conversation was the fact that we just brought on uh, a new group that was uh, moving from uh, ECW onto all scripts on essentially a optimized environment where, you know, the, the the beginning providers the in the primary care realm were left to sort of make do with what they had for a few years um, and ultimately, you know, created a scenario where, you know, they're wondering is this a solution that's going to be recoverable or not. Well, and I think the lesson from that was that um, the optimized platform was so much better that the acceptance and utilization by that practice, which is big and busy, was so much better than ever anticipated. And I know if we hadn't rolled out the optimized platform to them, um, if we had dared implement all scripts before it was optimized, the level of discomfort and dissatisfaction would have been much higher. Um, so we have just a few minutes left, and I just wanted to highlight some of the, the results of this optim optimization from uh, an objective perspective. So this is um, data that we did collect at one of the primary care physicians. It was the, one of the latter groups that went live. And we, we judged productivity based on patient load, and overall, um, and you can see in the slide, there was an 18% increase in productivity um, relative to pivotal tasks being executed at the practice. Um, and then, in addition, going back to the need to, you know, sort of quantify physician satisfaction, you can see that, um, you know, the note signatures um, over the course of a year, you know, post-optimization just, I think, I, I can't really read the screenshot, but it's over 90%, I believe. Um, that were finishing their notes prior to 6 p.m. So essentially, hopefully that means that they were not taking their work home with them. That's certainly a lot less than they did two years ago. So I think that we're going to try to wrap things up and open um, the floor for any questions. Um, this is just a sort of a summary um, uh, slide. So. If there are any questions, um, now is the time. Okay, thank you. We have about four minutes left, and we've got a couple questions that have come in, so I'm going to just jump right in here. Um, the first question that came in, were there any compliance issues around having MAs authorize prescription refills? 
some state nursing commissions don't allow even an RN to authorize a prescription refill. So I can answer that because what we did in the standards is we delegated that task. So we picked the most common medications that were needed to be refilled by the primary care physicians. And that that's blood pressure drugs, some antidepressants. It's a pretty common list. And we had a very specific renewal process whereby the MAs check on a chart and make sure that the patient meets all the criteria for safely renewing that medication. And the physicians have signed a uh, standing order to allow them to renew on their behalf. And, and that's the way that part works. You know, technically it's true. You're not supposed to uh, uh, have other folks renew medications unless they're licensed providers. But this way works very well, and it's been reviewed by compliance as well. I believe, uh, too, Rob, those uh, orders are ret retrospectively authorized yes. by the providers anyway. So they're reviewed and retrospectively authorized. Um, so it's not just the, the MA taking that action. Next question. OK, we have one more question here. Um, do you build tools that allow physicians to self-manage changes to the EHR? Do we build tools that allow physicians to... Um, I'm not sure I totally follow. I don't, I don't know if... Um, to self-manage changes to the EHR, so as opposed to um, having the, the group, uh, having your team make those changes that allow them to simply make changes. I have, yeah, I have not seen that type of approach um, deployed at this point. And and the reason, I mean, I can speak to that, you know, from a from a documentation perspective, for example, you know, it, it's it's not. I know providers want to document their way, but I think that there's value in having some sort of standardized approach to doing it um, a very specific way across the entire specialty because you're not just talking about, you know, those providers looking at their notes. You're talking about, well, a cardiologist note is going to be read by a PCP, and if the documentation is so variant across all the, the providers, it then makes more work on the, the referring providers. That's just my, you know, sort of subjective opinion on it. But. Yeah, and, and we try to get, garner input from all of the various providers through the, we have ongoing IT steering committee meetings every couple of weeks, and I think it's a pretty productive place because we can actually review and take back to change management specific requests and balance individual needs with the overall good of the group and the standards before we implement the changes. So on an individual level, not really. OK, we're just about done here. we got one more quick question. Um, th this one just came in. How many optimization staff worked on the effort, which I've heard can last 18 months? So um, speaking to my teams, um, we had three full-time dedicated resources, and um, the, the St. Charles team offered um, three or four dedicated trainers. That, I mean, obviously, they were doing training for net new users um, and uh, four application analysts, which you know, participated in build and configuration efforts, um, uh, but also had to maintain the system from a support perspective. So all in all, and then obviously leadership and um, the various members of the committees that we, we spoke about. I think if you added it all up, you'd probably come up with six or seven FTEs or the equivalent, something like that. And then, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's probably the accurate. And one of the, the best things that came out of this optimization is the the RIT team and our uh, analysts working hand in hand with the Galen consultants, I think they've learned an incredible amount about the the programming and, 
and all of the things on the back end of the EMR that weren't uh, taught when it was initially installed and implemented, and that's been a huge advantage. So now we can take over a lot of those functions ourselves. Not all, but a lot. Okay, thank you, John and, and Rob and John, for that very informative presentation. Now, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask the audience to take part in an exit survey that will be popping up on your screen. Thank you everyone for joining us today. You'll receive an email in the coming days with a link to the replay of this webinar for you to view again and share with a colleague. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.